Hey everyone, welcome to Word on Wednesday Live. Wow, live. It's December the 23rd. And uh, just two days, two more sleeps till Christmas, as they like to say. I don't know who they are, but somebody says that. So I've heard it out there. So anyway, uh, exciting times to, to uh, look forward to, uh, especially if you got kids or grandkids around. And uh, we, we have the grandkids, and so it's going to be a good time for Christmas this year. Uh, they're getting to that age. And that age hopefully lasts a long time because they're a lot of fun. Hey, I wanted to share something with you, show you something here. Um, let me uh, switch over to the camera and take a look at my ugly sweater, my Christmas sweater. Wore that tonight for you guys and uh, forgot that I had it, actually. And then I, I, I found it. So take a look at that. There's, there's the big guy himself right there. Bigfoot right there and then speaking of bigfoot there's a bigfoot there there's a bigfoot right back here and there's a christmas tree pine tree and the pine tree over here another bigfoot there and so forth so it's got this great pattern and you can kind of see the guy uh taking his his stroll i don't know if his name's daryl or or not I, I i'm not really sure so I didn't get to ask, but just thought you'd like to see my Christmas sweater before we get started. Just so you know, I am in the holiday spirit of things. Now I can't see to put this on. There we go. So you didn't need to see all that camera return. I could have done that with uh, this screen up. I'm not a good production guy. So, <laughs> but anyway... Uh, all right, let's uh, get started tonight with uh, WOW Live and see what is going on. Giants in the land, that's what we've been doing. Some people say that, uh, you know, that, that talk about Sasquatch, Bigfoot, uh, and questions come up, where did it come from? There are people, uh, I, I listen to podcasts, and there are people who will say, well, it's possible, or I think it has something to do with what happened in the Bible in Genesis 6 with the Nephilim and the giants in the land, because these are really big guys, and they look kind of human, but not really. And uh, so, you know, who knows? You know, it's it's uh, who knows what's going on out there and, and what has happened. I think there's more going on than what we realize. That's kind of the uh, phrase under which I operate. I go by biblical truth in all matters. But the Bible is a vast, vast landscape of uh, three-dimensional, four-dimensional beauty because time itself doesn't matter. So it's uh, quite a quite a challenge, and it actually opens up. There's a lot of freedom in believing what the Bible says. People think, oh, if I have to go by the Bible, then I have to live a really restricted life. Depends on what you think restrictions are, that's all. I like like the freedom to, to not sin, you know, that kind of thing. So that's that's probably pretty good. Anyway, let's get started. Last week, we concluded the lesson looking at two different serpent mounds. Uh, just kind of a, an interesting little thing that's out there. This one is the is in the land of the serpent, the, in the region known as Bashan, uh, north of uh, northern part of Israel, and on up into Syria today. Uh, and uh, this is located near a mount, uh, Gilgal Rephaim, which is a megalithic. Uh, Stonehenge kind of thing that was built in Israel, a circle of, of stones. I showed you pictures of it last week. You can kind of see it's sort of at the bottom there, but there's that blue tag that says something I can't read, Ruja Malhiri. So um, that's, that's the uh, Gilgal Rephaim, which means the circle of the giants. Uh, Bashan was known as the land of the giants, and so it's kind of interesting that the circle mound is there, uh, circle uh, rather of the giants is there, and then the serpent mound itself lies to the north of the circle and appears to be protecting that circle of the giants. And if you think about the seed of the serpent uh, producing giants, um, very, very interesting kind of combination. The other serpent mound we looked at is located in Adams County, Ohio. Now this mound depicts a writhing snake. It has a kind of a coiled tail at the end. You can sort of see it there at the top of the slide on the upper left. And it looks like down in the uh, lower right there, 
uh, that it's about to eat, the snake is about to eat what either appears to be an egg or possibly a seed. And when you think about the, the, the desire to stop or prevent, uh, the, the, the yearning, the longing to prevent the seed of the woman from coming because the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head, right? The combined imagery of both those mounds is very interesting when you look at it uh, through the lens of ancient prophecy that was laid out by the Creator Himself in the very beginnings of Earth's history right after uh, man sinned in the garden. And God says to the serpent, uh, Satan, uh, also known as the Nakash, by the way, that's what the word translated as serpent is. It means the shining one, the word Nakash. And a uh, very interesting word, but I don't have time to go into it right now. Um, but God says to the serpent, to the Nakash, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. There's going to be a wall of separation between you and between your seed and her seed, capital S. He, her seed, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I repeat this prophecy time and again just simply because I think it's so critical to understanding the way the rest of the Bible unfolds. There's a battle going on, and it's described right here, enmity. Uh, you're going to be enemies one of another, and there's going to be a battle for these human beings. All right, God addresses Satan here in this prophetic proclamation. Revelation 12:9 describes the casting out of the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In this Genesis prophecy, Genesis 3.15, war is being declared between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We've discussed how the seed of the woman, the virgin-born son of God, Jesus Christ, has come to destroy Satan and his work. And we've considered together that Satan seeks to be like the Most High God. We've talked about how Satan and his seed, his progeny, okay, tried to prevent the coming of the seed of the woman. And we've said that this is what led to rebellious sons of God, uh, angelic beings, taking the daughters of men as wives for themselves with the point of corrupting the human seed in an effort to prevent the advent of the seed of the woman. Okay, Satan is trying to stop that right from the get-go and he's doing all he can, and that's kind of what we're still covering here tonight. Uh, it really is the root of the Christmas story. It's not a mistake to have the nativity out there under Genesis 3.15. It's the reason the seed of the woman came. This <clears throat> planned corruption that, that uh, Satan worked out gave birth to the Nephilim, the giants in the earth in those days, uh, the days before the flood, and also to further efforts towards corrupting uh, things after the flood, whenever the sons of God would go in to the daughters of men and they would bear children to these rebels, these rebellious angel beings. We saw how giant uh, clans, whole tribes of giants overran the land of Canaan during the 400 years that the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. They overtook the promised land land promised to Abraham to Israel. The Nephilim were there, the Amorites, the Anakim, the Zamzamim, also known as the Zuzim, uh, the Imim, and the Rephaim, giant clans. I believe the effort was being made to keep Israel out of her land, that the seed of the woman might somehow be prevented. However, during the conquest of Canaan under Joshua's leadership, the giant clans were routed from the promised land as God gave the Israelites victory after victory and, and drove them out. However, as Joshua 11.22 says, the Anakim remained in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, which are along the Mediterranean coastline there in Israel close to Tyre and Sidon, just a little south of, of those places. The Phoenicians, the Philistines were over there. Later, Goliath of Gath, the nearly 10-foot-tall champion of the Philistines, threatens the army of Israel. And God sends in David to take Goliath out. Goliath literally lost his head. Fascinating to think that Goliath's head represented the true seed of the serpent. 
the giants. That's the seed of the serpent. And that David was part of the bloodline to bring about the coming of the seed of the woman. When Christ returns, he will sit on the throne of his father, David. That's proclaimed in Luke, actually, chapter 1, that the the father will give to uh, your son, Mary, the throne of his father, David, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Gabriel tells Mary that in Luke chapter 1. We therefore see pictured here in this battle, between David and Goliath, Goliath the, the very essence of that Genesis 3.15 pro- prophecy, where the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, just as David took off the head of the giant. A prophecy such as this one, this Genesis 3.15 prophecy, it tells us that there's a plan. Satan knew immediately, there's a plan, something's going to unfold. Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is not someone seeing into the future with a crystal ball or something, or tea leaves or whatever, or looking at your palm, and then reporting back to you, hey, this is what I see coming. I I predict that this event will take place in the future. No, Bible prophecy is this, folks. It's God telling us what his plans are, what he's going to do combined with his amazing faithfulness to do whatever it is he's promised and whatever he's planned to do. Bible prophecy is therefore history that is being written in advance. Micah 5.2 says this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrata means fruitful. It sounds very much like a place of blessing, a place of sustenance. And certainly that's what the ruler who come at, came out of there, uh, the ruler of Israel, uh, certainly brings blessing. He brings sustenance. He's the bread of life, right? We read in Genesis about the death of Jacob's wife, Rachel. Uh, it says in Genesis 35, 19 and 20, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. So Rachel's grave, uh, Jacob's uh, uh, wife, his first wife, he, he married the uh, sisters there, and uh, but Rachel passed away giving birth to Benjamin. She died after a difficult labor, uh, and um, so he buried her near Bethlehem. The, the, the weeping prophet Jeremiah then gives reference to, to, to Rachel lamenting over her children. Je- Jeremiah thirty-one fifteen. Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. In this poetic sense, Rachel is being used as a metaphor, as the mother of all of Israel, and she is weeping, because her children are being carried into exile in Babylon. That's what's happening in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah's time. But Rachel is buried in Bethlehem. And Matthew, therefore, uses this passage in another sense, in a prophetic sense, in his gospel. Chapter 2 of Matthew, verses 16 through 18. Then Herod the king the Idumean, Idumean king, the one appointed rulership by Rome. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. 
You know, the serpent Satan is the one who drives this direct assault on these poor, helpless women and their children using a maniacal political appointee who feared for his illegitimate throne because of the announcement being made by travelers from the east who had come to worship the true king of the Jews, the new king of the Jews. An attempt by Satan in Bethlehem to yet again stop this seed of the woman from coming. There's no doubt in my mind that King Herod suffered under demonic influence, if not outright possession by demons on this particular occasion. It was a horrid thing that he did taking the life of innocent children. That still happens today, you know. Leaders in our country support the taking of the life of children. One aspect of the birth of Jesus which draws my attention is how often in the whole account, how often elements from the heavenly realm, both good elements and evil ones, how they manifest in this earthly realm in these supernatural ways. It's like whatever's happening over there when it gets active tends to bleed through into our own world. The intensity of spiritual warfare must have increased astronomically as it became more and more clear to the evil spiritual forces and the rulers of darkness that God the Son was about to enter our realm as a human being. It must have blown their minds to consider what was happening. Scrambling to start doing what they needed to do. In Bethlehem, children and their young mothers fell victim to the hellish madness of that hour. Think about this. Over the past year, you and I, our families and friends, we have endured some of the most bizarre human behavior that we have ever seen in our lifetimes. It's almost like the curtain is down, the gloves are off, the masks are taken off and then put on. As they tell us to put on, their own masks are revealed. Our, our, our faces are revealed. Do not fall for the lie that's designed to lull you into an apathetic stupor whenever you're told, oh, this is the new normal now. Don't believe that. Don't accept it. If there was ever a time when the war being fought behind the scenes in that spiritual realm, if there was ever a time that such a thing broke through that veil between the realms, between the spiritual realm and this one, and manifested then in weird and strange ways in our realm, this past year was certainly that time in my humble estimation. And to press that a little further, I don't really expect it to get much better. Every year, for many years, I've watched the movie It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas time. I can remember buying a VHF copy, a VHS copy of the movie back in uh, uh, very high fidelity. Is that what I was doing with VHF? I'm not sure. Uh, VHS copy of the movie on uh, video cassette tape back in 1986. Okay, you do the math there. It, it works out to like 34 years ago, and I've watched it ever since, just every year, at least once. For those of you familiar with the movie, if our nation as we remember it was once Bradford, Bedford Falls, well, it's, it's more and more quickly becoming Pottersville. There's a lot of Mr. Potters out there running the show, and Ms. Potters as well. Spiritual warfare was exploding into our realm when Jesus was born. Herod's attack on this new king of the Jews failed. Why? Because the principles were protected by God. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And when the Magi heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down, and they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then 
Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their country, uh, their own country, another way. We'll get to the mystery of that star shortly. Undoubtedly, the Magi from the East were in Bethlehem on that particular time as a result of Bible prophecies which were part of their training. Training that had been handed down the line to them for about 500 years, going back to the time when Daniel, the Hebrew prophet, took over the instruction of the Magi in Babylon and then later in Persia. You see, uh, that was God working back then, at Daniel's time, doing prep work for this particular day when these wise men would find the child in that house. And the wise men, after finding the young child right where the star had led them, worshipped him, they gave him their gifts, and then they were warned in a dream to not return to Herod. And so they left for home a different way. A divine revelation from God through a dream to spare these men. In three times in Matthew's account, Joseph is given divine revelation by means of a dream. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, Joseph, for the child she is carrying has been conceived of the Holy Spirit. Later, Joseph will learn that Herod has died, and, and therefore it's safe for him to leave Egypt and to return to Nazareth. But in this particular moment right here, when all this is happening in Bethlehem, are getting ready to happen, and Herod's troops are marching on the town. Joseph needs to save his family from Herod's soldiers. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him destroying the seed of the woman. Can you see the evidence of what must have been going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm? We could talk about it so much more. This star, for example. The Magi come to Jerusalem at the beginning of chapter 2 talking about this star. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 say this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They likely knew to look for a star because of a prophecy from back in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. That prophecy may well have been passed down to them from what Daniel and perhaps even other Jewish teachers in Babylon and Persia after Daniel had taught the Magi of the East during and after the Babylonian captivity. They had been taught uh, the Messiah, the king of the Jews, was coming. And they'd been taught that a star would manifest proclaiming he had come into the world. When Herod decided to kill the young male children of Bethlehem, Matthew tells us that he chose the age of two as the maximum age for the children in Bethlehem based upon what the Magi had told him about the time when this star had appeared to them. So the star had first shown up about two years before the Magi even arrived. We can suppose that the star appeared, its significance was assessed, plans to travel were made, and then undertaken, and this star was in the sky the entire time for nearly two years. You name any comet you choose to name, any asteroid out there, or any planetary alignments, name any that lasts for two years that shows up on our skies for two years solid. Let me save you the trouble. 
There are none. A couple of days ago, Jupiter and Saturn aligned on the night of the winter solstice, the 21st. We had a rainy night with clouds. Last time those two planets aligned on the winter solstice was about 800 years ago. If we didn't see it Monday night, we ain't going to see it. But the real star of Bethlehem was in the sky and visible for two years. No natural phenomena of the night sky can do that. See, folks, this was a unique celestial object, one of a kind, just like the king that it was proclaiming, just like the, the, the Messiah it was announcing. One of a kind object. I believe it was created and designed specifically for the birth of Christ by God himself. A few moments ago, we read that the Magi followed the star until it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. It's standing over where the ch young child was, was. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child. So it stopped over the house. The star moved until it stopped directly over the house. And the men on the ground knew that. They could tell that that's where it stopped. And it appeared in such a manner that the Magi knew which house to enter. We aren't told how they knew, really, other than just that the star was there and they knew. Did this star, in air quotes there, shine a beam of light on the house? Did it come down and hover directly over the house? We, we don't know. Big sign out there, there it is, this is the place. Big arrow pointing down. You, we don't know. Here's one for you. Think about this. If you stood in front of the house, okay, the star is over the house and you're coming up on it, and you saw the star in the air over the roof of the house, all right? And if you then walked around to the back of the house and still facing towards the house, now you're facing the opposite direction as what you were on the other side of the house, and you looked up above the roof, would you still see the star over the house? You get what I'm saying? By contrast, if you saw Jupiter and Saturn in the sky over your house lined up, and you walked around your house to the other so side, you would now have to, to look away from your house. Your house would be to your back in order to still see Jupiter and Saturn, right? You can walk around your house, but Jupiter and Saturn are so stinking far away from Earth, you can't walk around them and have them somehow now be behind you, all right? In fact, you can travel from here to the ocean, either the Atlantic or the Pacific, it doesn't really matter, and you're not going to really change your orientation to Jupiter and Saturn, providing, of course, time wasn't a factor, and you could instantly be at Myrtle Beach or Waikiki in Hawaii. doesn't matter. But this star of Bethlehem sounds like it could get close enough to the house that you possibly could actually walk around to the other side of it. The idea being that if Two magi, let's say, we're speculating, were approaching the star from opposite directions, they would both end up at the same house, even though they're walking toward each other. I don't know if this is exactly how it was, I'm just saying, but the way the text reads, it sounds like it was an object within our atmosphere that lit up brightly and guided them somehow. It's different. It's not a star in the conventional sense. It's not a planet. Some people were saying that, that Jupiter and Saturn aligning must have been the star of Bethlehem. And, and they trace it all the way back to 7 BC or whenever. And they say, see, they, they were lined up then too. It must be the star of Bethlehem. But Jupiter and Saturn don't act like the actual star of Bethlehem acted according to the text in the Bible. Don't let science tell you what the Bible says, folks. Let the Bible tell you what the Bible says. Don't let science try to dictate, well, it must have been this. Doubt it. <laughs> I just doubt it, at least in this case. Dr. Don DeYoung, he's a physicist. He's a Christian also. And he writes about 
uh, this star in Matthew's gospel. He says this, two details in Matthew are of special interest. First, the text implies that only the Magi saw the star. That's interesting. No one else seems to have seen it. Comets, conjunctions, and exploding stars would be visible to everyone on earth. And second, the star went before the Magi and led them from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. This is a distance of about six miles in a direction from north to south. However, not only does every natural object in the sky move from east to west due to the Earth's rotation, but it is difficult to imagine how a natural light could lead the way to a particular house. The conclusion is that the star of Bethlehem cannot be explained by science. It was a temporary and supernatural light. After all, was not the first Christmas a time of miracles? God has often used special heavenly lights to guide his people, such as the glory that filled the tabernacle in Exodus 40, and the temple in 1 Kings 8, and that shone upon the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. Such visible signs of God's presence are known as the Shekinah glory, or dwelling place of God. This special light is a visible manifestation of divine majesty. The great mystery of the first Christmas is not the origin of its special star. It is the question of why the Magi were chosen to follow the light to the Messiah, and why we are given the same invitation today. Hmm. Dr. DeYoung asks there in that phrase, that, that paragraph, if the first Christmas was not indeed a time of miracles. Uh, that it was demonstrates to us again. As we've been saying, there was so much activity in the spiritual realm as the inhabitants of that realm begin to realize what God was doing, that God the Son was actually stepping into his own creation. Think of the number of times you know of where angels are taking part in what is was happening at that time. In, in this case, we could actually go back to say the prophet Daniel, as an angel was sent several times to relay messages to him concerning the coming of the Messiah, the seed of the woman, For in another word. Uh, here is one instance in particular, Daniel chapter 9, Verses 20 to 22, Daniel says, While I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Gabriel, an angel who appears like a man, right? He looks like a man. He comes to Daniel to give him a prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. And in verse 24, it starts. Here's what Gabriel tells Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah comes, Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streets shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined." Then he, the one who is the prince that shall come, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, 
and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, Gabriel, the angel, mentions several times here the word weak or weeks. The literal meaning of the Hebrew word translated here as weeks is actually the word sevens, okay? So he talks, she talks to him about these 70 weeks that have been determined for Daniel's people, that means Israel, and Daniel's city, that means Jerusalem, okay? 70 weeks. Uh, and, and each week in this passage means a period of seven years, not seven days, but seven years per week. Hence, when Gabriel begins uh, verse 24 saying 70 weeks are determined for Daniel, Daniel's people Israel, he means 70 seven long year, year long periods of time, or 490 years. Now, that 70 weeks is divided into three segments a seven week long segment, or 49 years long a 62-week-long segment, or 434 years long, and a one-week-long segment, seven years long. You're given the impression that at the end of each of these segments, some significance happens, some change takes place. For instance, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it says there that after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off meaning that the Messiah is going to be killed. Jesus, the Messiah, was, of course, put to death. And from our vantage point nearly 2,000 years later, Gabriel in Daniel 9 is talking about Jesus here. The 62 weeks follows the 7 weeks. And because this prophecy overall focuses on Daniel's people Israel and the city of Jerusalem, as it says in verse 24, we can assume that those two segments of time, the seven weeks and 62 weeks, are consecutive. One follows right after the other. And as they are, ultimately, they will conclude with the death of Israel's Messiah at his first coming, his first advent. That baby in a manger was born to die for you and for me. Anyway, adding up together the two, we have 62 weeks plus 7 weeks, that equals 69 weeks. At 7 years per week, that adds up to 483 years. Also, as I've pointed out several times on these slides but haven't said anything, those 483 years, or those years, would be years according to the Jewish calendar. Jewish calendar has 360 day long years instead of 365 days per year. So, to convert our calculations from a Jewish calendar to our own calendar, the easiest thing to do is to work with the number of days taught, being talked about here. Because no matter what calendar one uses, a day is still 24 hours long. So, 483 years times 360 days per year in a Jewish year equals 173,880 days. Now, from Daniel 9.25, we read that we should know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, from one thing, one event to another event, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The 483 Jewish years, or those 173,880 days, begins when a command is issued to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 6 through 6, we read how the king of Persia, uh, one known as Artaxerxes Longimanus, had issued a decree for Nehemiah to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. And we know and understand from Nehemiah's record and other records of history that the date that he made this decree, using our calendar now, was March the 14th, 445 BC. So, using our calendar with adjustments for 119 leap days that would take place during that 483 years passing by, or those 173,880 days, if you will, and then tweaking that uh, time also uh, according 
to the uh, adjustments that would be needed for the actual rotation of the Earth, which is longer than 24 hours per day, uh, by one 128th of a day. Uh, it's actually a little longer, and you make adjustments for that. We find that 173,880 days from March the 14th, 445 BC, falls on or fell on Sunday, April the 6th, 32 AD. Now that was Palm Sunday. That was the beginning of the week in which the Messiah would be cut off. It's exactly what the prophecy said. It goes down to the exact time frame. He marches into Jerusalem and says, I'm going to be, I am offering you as the Messiah, as to be your king, and I will set up my kingdom now. And they reject him and put him to death. The Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. He didn't do anything. He died because of other people's sins. You know, I don't believe you necessarily have to follow all the math here to be amazed about the accuracy of the message that the angel Gabriel brought to Daniel on that day. Daniel and, and all the magi that he trained there in Babylon and Persia, east of Jerusalem, they, none of them may have known all the particulars that we can now factor in using hindsight like we can. But being that the Magi studied the skies, being that they knew the seasons, they knew their calendars, much more important to them than what we have today, they could have known with fair certainty the time frame within which the Messiah, the coming king of the Jews, would arise. To put it another way, the Magi alive around the time of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem would have been looking for his star to appear. They would have been looking for it. They knew the times that they were in. Revelation from God through dreams, revelation from God through prophecies, through angels appearing in the thwarting of the efforts made by the serpent Satan and the rulers of supernatural darkness to try and stop the Messiah, the seed of the woman from coming, all together gives us numerous glimpses into this battle raging in the spiritual realm as God the Son came to earth as a baby in a manger. As I said before, you really do have to wonder, what did Satan know about all of this, and when did he know it? From the start of his corrupting of our original parents to sin and to rebel against the Creator, the serpent Satan knew that this seed of the woman who would destroy him, he knew that that had been promised by God the Creator. Satan then knew that God had a plan to do away with him and with his works. Satan tried to counter this through the conception of the Nephilim, as we've read often from Genesis 6 in this study on giants. And these giants we're studying, they were corruptions of the human seed. That's what we're really talking about. When the boundary that God had established between the angelic realm and the human race was crossed, now, if you're doubting that boundary, uh, consider this passage here from Psalm chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made man a little lower than the angels. Hmm. Involved in his own Nephilim countermeasure, Satan had it, hadn't counted on the flood of judgment that was coming, destroying his seed while preserving the human seed that would lead to the seed of the woman. Everything rested upon a boat at that time. On the other side of the flood in time, some kind of rebellious angelic incursion must have occurred. Nimrod, whom we said may well have been a Nephilim, a giant, a product, again, of, of angelic and, and, and human uh, uh, mixture, attempted to organize the growing human population to rally around himself. He said, follow the counsel of Nimrod. Don't follow the counsel of God anymore. Listen to me. He was forming the first world empire, establishing many cities and attempting to build a tower around which the entire world could rally, opposing what God had commanded them to do, to spread out, not to stay together. 
we can again see Satan's angle here. If having a one-world government was successful, it would be so much easier to prevent the seed of the woman from coming. If he could rally everyone in the world against this whole idea, he'd have a, a fighting chance. I believe that's what he felt and what he still feels. Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through 7. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. There's unity here. Unity is not always a good thing, folks, in case you're wondering. Sometimes we talk about unity. We need unity in the church. Yeah, well, we need unity around the truth of the word. That's what brings unity in the church. You can unify around a lot of things, but that's not necessarily good. Indeed, the people here are one. They all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose, propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Thus the Lord divided the people into separate nations, and again established boundaries enforced by the language barrier. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9, sheds more light on this situation. I'm going to use the English Standard Version here, the translation of this verse, because it's more accurate. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Verse 9, But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. Verse 8 is the Gentile world, all right? That's the world of the nations, the goyim. He gave to the nations their inheritance. Verse 9 is Israel, the descendants of Abraham. Notice in verse 8 that God fixed the borders of the nations, the peoples, according to the number of the sons of God. We've seen already in this series that the sons of God are angelic. God placed heavenly beings over each nation that he established at Babel. He gave the sons of God jurisdiction, stewardship, responsibility for the oversight of those nations. They're going to fail, as we'll find out in a little bit. In verse 9, God has established Israel as his portion. This is his inheritance, his heritage. In Genesis 11, Babel happens, giving us what we read here in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. In Genesis 12, Abraham is called out from among those nations to become a nation of people dedicated to God, thus giving us what we read there in Deuteronomy 32, and verse 9. And I'll bet Satan didn't miss this move at all. He saw what was happening. He's paying attention to what God is doing. His destruction by the seed of the woman was obviously going to happen somehow through the seed of this Abraham fellow. In fact, through Abraham, God had said all the families of the earth would be blessed. Hmm. Sounds like the seed of the woman is coming. It's worth noting here that the sons of God in charge of those nations, they also rebelled against God. Psalm 62 tells us about this. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, God says, Selah? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, God said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, sons of God, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die, and fall like any prince. And the psalmist concludes, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you 
shall inherit all the nations. Notice immediately that God presides over this council of the divine beings. He's taken his place, his seat at the divine council table. He's called a council meeting, a time when the sons of God would come and present themselves before him. We see the same thing in the book of Job in two locations, verse chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 1. And we're told here in verse 1 of Psalm 62 that God is now going to execute judgment judgment he's holding judgment here of these sons of god the sons of the most high they are called gods here in verse 6 the word is elohim meaning that they are inhabitants of the heavenly or spiritual realm these sons of god were placed over the nations to direct the leaders of those nations to alleviate conditions in their lands conditions that had arose because of sin conditions of poverty and affliction look at what god says there in 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 the the verse there give justice to the weak and to the orphans to the fatherless take care of the afflicted take care of the sick ones in your nations and the poor in your nations the destitute and deliver them from those wicked people who are oppressing them but these sons of god are actually in league with the wicked nation the wicked leaders of leaders of these nations it, god says how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked this state of things in the nations of the world in the decades and centuries after babel this lays a foundation for these rebellious sons of god to become gods and goddesses themselves within these nations see this is where the ancient gods and goddesses that we hear about from mythologies and belief systems from all over the ancient world this is where they have their spiritual roots in this rebellion of the powers the principalities the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places that's what this is where it starts in verses six and seven god therefore proclaims you know you may well be gods you might be divine beings from the day you were all created but all of you are going to die like men and the psalmist agrees with this judgment of god and praises god by saying that he will inherit the nations Babel itself will be undone one day there's one coming who will rule all the nations of the earth now, folks, you may be wondering why it is I'm sharing all these different things this evening right here before Christmas. But, folks, what I'm laying out for you here is the basic foundations and the events which underlie the spiritual war we are all in. And it is exactly why the ultimate holy and righteous strategy of God was to send God the Son to earth as a baby. To redeem everything that is what we are celebrating and why we are worshiping him and coming to adore him i bet you never thought that a verse in in the book of haggai in the old testament could be a, a christmas verse look at this chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 for thus says the lord of hosts once more it is a little while i will shake heaven and earth the sea and dry land and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple in Jerusalem with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Those who are weak, those who are fatherless and, and afflicted, ill and sick and destitute, they long for hope. They long for relief. They desire. This is why we sing at Christmas, Come, desire of nations, come, offspring of the virgin's womb. The seed of the woman is the desire of all nations. But wickedness is ruling in all of these nations. And spiritual wickedness in high spiritual places is in league with them. This is the foundation for what we read then in Psalm 2, and with, with this we'll close. Verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, 
Let us break their bonds in pieces, and let us cast their cords from us. The wicked in the nations plot together in their rage against God. If you can't see that this is the very thing that is happening in the world around you right now, friend, you need to awaken. You need to see things the way they really are, as the Bible describes them. This is the reason for my emphasis on the spiritual realm this evening, to look behind the scenes, to pull the curtain back and see the man back there, to see what's really going on. The kings of the earth in this verse, I believe, are human leaders. The rulers taking counsel together are, I believe, rebellious sons of God. And there's a collusion between the realms. The idea of joining wicked angels and wicked humans together was literally birthed when the Nephilim were born, as recorded in Genesis 6. The claim is and always has been the cry of fallen humanity. God seeks to bind us. He's trying to keep us from being free to do and to be what we want to be. We need to have a say in this. The cry today of those who profess tolerance while not being able to tolerate God, not being able to tolerate Jesus, not being able to tolerate the Bible, and not tolerating those who follow him is that we must allow them by law. We must accept by social conduct that they can be whatever they want to be. Anything less, you see, is intolerant on our part. Very soon, it will likely become illegal for us to hold those views. And the world leaders who seem to support these folks in their agenda, in reality, have their own personal agendas to oppress those who are under their thumbs. It might not go the way these tolerant ones want it to go. In the spirit of Nimrod, they want a global government, and they'll do anything and everything with no consideration of morality or ethics to get exactly what they want. That's what they're about, folks. Verses 4 through 6 says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Jesus Christ was born to be king of the Jews. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Said, asked the Magi. For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. God the Father laughs at the futile and foolish efforts of humans who would rebel with no hope of them ever repenting. What possibly are they going to be able to do for themselves? And then he reveals his wrath to them. For he's going to place his king on the throne of David in Jerusalem to rule and to reign over all the earth. And he will rule with a rod of iron. Jesus now speaks. I will declare the decree, verse 7 through 9. The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the realization, folks, of what we read in Psalm 82. God the Father will give God the Son the nations as his inheritance, thus bringing judgment upon the rulers of spiritual wickedness who have corrupted so much in their awful times on earth. And then the psalmist now closes with this warning for the nations. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. My hope and my prayer is that, that what I have shared this evening regarding the spiritual war underlying the very reason for Christmas has in some measure enlightened you and perhaps given you some more insight into why there was this offspring of the woman, a baby in a manger. 
for angels in heaven to proclaim and to praise, and for all the lowly among us on earth who come and adore and worship him. I'm going to go fetch my wife here, see if she'll come and say Merry Christmas to you all. Hang on. Founder. Here I am. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. We love you all. Thank you so much for, for being a part of our lives and supporting us in so many ways. Yep. Thank you so much. God bless. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Good night.